Okay, so good morning uh, or good afternoon, everybody, for this webinar on the control of greenhouse gas emission in ruminant farming. Uh, uh, some, some a few words of an welcoming you on behalf of WAP, uh, World Association for Animal Production, which gather 18 worldwide organizations uh, in animal science. I am president of this organization currently. And uh, the next Congress of this organization, organization will be uh, in Lyon next year in August uh, with a general team on climate change, biodiversity and global sustainability of animal production. Uh, one day on the Sunday 27th of August will be dedicated to two sessions with invited speakers. The first one is a control of greenhouse gas emissions. It is the same subject as uh, today. And in the afternoon, the role of livestock system in the preservation of biodiversity. And then we will have four days from 28 to 31 of August with 10 common session, sessions with EAP. So you will find more information uh, in the uh, addresses which will be on the chat uh, in a few minutes. Uh, for today, uh, for this uh, session of control, uh, this webinar of control of greenhouse gas emission in ruminant farming, we will have uh, three speakers. First, Diego Morgavi from Minerai France. Uh, uh, he will speak on uh, the options to reduce enteric methane emissions from uh, ruminants through feed additives and uh, a specific spotlight on early life. And then Andrea Vitali from uh, Universitat del, del Tuscia uh, in Italy on uh, ruminants and climate change, uh, especially on the impact of ruminants on climate and mitigation strategies. And then Frank Mitlohenner from uh, UC University California Davis on the pathway to climate neutrality for the beef and dairy sectors. So uh, after each presentation of these three speakers, you will have uh, 10 minutes of question and answers via the chat. Uh, and the webinar will be recorded and further available on the EAP website, restricted area. And after three months, it will be public and available on the official uh, YouTube uh, EAP channel. So uh, there is a each month, I think, a webinar like that. So please uh, learn more about that by visiting our site. So please, uh, uh, Diego, if you want to start with your presentation. Uh, Diego, just a few words uh, while you are installing your, your slides. Uh, so I said already that you are from INRA, France working at the Division of Animal Physiology and Livestock Systems. And you work on uh, research in gastrointestinal microbiology, animal nutrition, and animal science. So Diego, you have the floor for about 20 minutes. And please, audience, prepare your question in the chat. Diego? You have to put your microphone on. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so you can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, you have the problem. <laughs> uh, thank you, Philippe, for the introduction and for the invitation to give this uh, to participate in this webinar. Um, so I will talk about the options to reduce enteric methane emissions from ruminants, but uh, making particularly a focus on early life. But before that, I would like, before starting with the subject, I would like to give some numbers uh, on, in livestock. I uh, have to remember that uh, livestock sustain about 1.3 billion people with direct and indirect jobs. Um, just the livestock uh, represent about 2% of the global gross domestic product. And um, of course, in some low income countries, this percentage is much higher. And they have a really, they are crucial in food security. And they are also important in the animal products uh, are also important in human nutrition. About 29% of the daily intake in protein comes from 
animal sourced food. And again, as for the global gross domestic product, there are large disparities between countries. Like for average, you have 49% of the protein intake in high income countries and just 13% in low income countries. If we Take the Eat Lancet reference diet, which is supposed to be a healthy diet for humans and also um, good for the environment. They suggest uh, to have a daily animal protein intake and dairy uh, intake. That's the um, what is suggested. But when you go through different parts of the world, that uh, equation is quite different. And depending, again, where you are situated, like in Europe, we have an, we have an intake of higher than what is suggested in animal protein and dairy. Uh, you can see it in here. And like in sub-Saharan Africa, there's no enough intake comparing to the diet. And also there's a difference in the, the way that uh, people can afford those kind of diets. In That's the 10% of the average um, salary in Europe that affording the planetary health diet of the Eat Lancet will be about three quarters of the of the average uh, salary in sub-Saharan countries. The OECD uh, in a recent report in, from in 2020, they expect an increase in per annum of livestock food consumption uh, about 1.4%. Uh, up to 2030. Uh, taking that, uh, that is, in, is not enough to meet the sustainable development goal, number two, that is zero hunger. And if we want to meet that uh, SDG two, and at the same time, keep the Paris Agreement targets on greenhouse gas emissions, we will have to increase the productivity of animals by about 31%, which is, uh, I think is not attainable. On the other hand, uh, livestock also affect planetary boundaries. Uh, they affect the water cycle, they affect the land use, and what is of interest for us today, they also affect the climate change particularly because of this, the emissions in greenhouse gas, gases. So where these emissions come from? Mainly the bulk of the emissions come from cattle. Uh, you can see here in the figure from the FAO. And there's up to 39% of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture that come from enteric fermentation. So, sorry, on the last figure is the total emissions of greenhouse gas. And from that, the, the main gas that is produced in agriculture come from enteric fermentation. That is 39% uh, taking the most used metrics uh, of um, CO2 equivalent uh, to a horizon of 100 years. And I think uh, other speakers will expand a little bit on different metrics. And But if we took only the methane emissions, they represent about 27% of the global anthropogenic methane emissions. In the global methane emissions, you have the, the main emissions sources are fossil fuels and biomass and also agriculture, which is 
larger than the others, and from the whole emissions that are attributed to human activity, we can see that uh, that's the 20% uh, that belongs to enteric fermentation. So methane is of interest, I would say, for, for climate change because it's a short-lived atmospheric pollutant that have a perturbation lifetimes of only about 12 years comparing to thousands of years for CO2. And reducing the emissions uh, into the atmosphere can have an impact in climate in the medium term. So the, that's included in the Paris Agreement in the COP21. And in the latest COP, the COP26 in Glasgow, there's the methane pledge in which a number of countries uh, pledge to reduce the global methane emissions for at least 30%. And that uh, also will include agriculture if the pledge is uh, fulfilled. So, so in agriculture, we, there is a need for effective mitigation options that those options should be applicable to different production systems. And also they have to be adopted, of course. Of the strategies that we have at the presently to reduce methane emissions uh, from ruminant production, there are several that um, we can, th there's a small list here. The, the easiest way is the management, improve management to you improve nutrition, reproduction. You reduce the production life uh, cycle length of your animals to, to get to the market. And you will increase or you will decrease the amount of uh, carbon equivalent per kilogram of meat or per kilogram of uh, milk. So that you will reduce, reduce the intensity of your emissions, but that's good. Uh, but in per se, it will not reduce the total amount of methane emitted uh, that is um, released into the atmosphere. Other strategies are animal genetics that I will not touch. Um, the other one is trying to act on the rumen fermentation. That is by modulating the fermentation activities or by modulating the microbiota. And most of these strategies are dietary strategies. In, so, I will focus a little bit on the feeds and feeds additives without um, for feed and feed additives uh, we can see two different mode, mode of actions. Uh, you have the generalist type of mode of, or mode of action that you will have activities on, on the whole environment of the room or the gastrointestinal tract. And the specific mode of action will be more focusing on either on methanogens or the methanogenic pathway. So the approaches um, are several approaches are have been tested. Um, they are in the process also of being tested, then you can find several publications in which um, these approaches are listed, um, evaluated. Um, the, though all, all these uh, approaches, uh, the, the first one like a cereal rich diet, uh, lipid supplementation, the use of nitrates, um, they are most um, generalist because the they mode of action, they act on, on different aspects of the rumen ecosystem. And we have also inhibitors, which are more specific. We can name um, the bromoform, 
for instance, that is contained in some seaweeds that is tested and used, and used in some part of the world. And also we can mention the methane inhibitor, which is the 3 nitroxypropanol um, which is commercially available also. All these inhibitors or approaches, they have to be used every day. Uh, so they have to be provided to the animal every day to be effective. And once um, you stop the treatment, sorry about that, when you stop the treatment, um, the methane production come back to, to what it was before. So th there's a high resilience in the ecosystem, in the room ecosystem, and because the methane production function is all highly resistant, and also there's the high diversity of the microbiota. So this is the case of most um, adult animals. Uh, so in adult animals, once you stop the additive, you the effect doesn't persist. However, in early life, so after the animal um, is born, the microbial colonization of the rumen is, is quite progressive and you don't have that resilience and that high um, uh, um, the ecosystem is 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 still in not mature. So th that process is well known in in ruminants. Thus, this is the example of lambs, but also you can see that in cattle with a, a different, a little bit different time frame, but and. Uh, when the animal is born, it's almost um, the ecosystem is almost uh, pristine. There, there's no almost no microbes, and they are acquired from the the early birth. So there are microbes, uh, bacteria, which are installed after that anaerobic bacteria. The, the, we can see the methanogenic archaea that also start uh, rather early in the, in the process. And after that, we have all the other components of the, of the microbiota that are getting, uh, colo that colonize and get into the, into the room until the animal, um, after winning, that's another important point in the colonization and the maturation of the rumen. And after that, we can consider that the animal have more or less the adult uh, community in, that is uh, present, that will be present uh, throughout their life. This process, as I said, is progressive. Um, we know also that early life event can affect the diversity of the gastrointestinal tract, for instance, um, when the animal is, um, how the animal is born by C-section or natural birth, whether there was antibiotic treatment, management practice also can have uh, an important role in this colonization process. And we know also that some of these changes in the microbial diversity can persist later in life. So the question is, it is possible to modulate the gastrointestinal tract colonization to decrease methane emissions? There are a, a few publications in which they use the kind of generalist feed additives that I was mentioning before, like coconut oil, linseed oil, garlic oil. And in all of those cases, after the treatment was stopped, there was an effect on the bacterial communi community However, no effect on methane phenotype was observed. 
So the methane uh, comparing to control animals was the same, methane emissions. Uh, using a specific feed additive like uh, BCM, um, in this case uh, using goats as animal models, uh, the authors also observed a persistent effect on this case on archaeal communities and the methane on methane was observed up to three months on, on the kids and dogs. We did an experiment lately on 3NOB, which is a specific uh, inhibitor of methane. And I will tell you a little bit more about this uh, study and what we saw. So the study was using 18 female their calves uh, that were divided into two groups. Um, the animals were treated uh, half of the group, uh, half of the, animals, of the animals were treated by 3NOB garbage up to week 14. Animals were weaned at week 18 and methane was measured from week 11 to week 23. And after that, the animals were together uh, with, the, with the herd and other animals in the herd, and they were remission at week 48-61. So for the growth of the animals, we didn't see any effect of the treatment, so they were more or less the same. Uh, growth and weight, I uh, will go quickly here. Um, there were no particular differences between the two groups, and we didn't observe either differences in the milk or concentrate intake. Rumen fermentation uh, was uh, no difference also. Uh, we couldn't see any changes in volatile fatty acid production or ammonia. And for methane emissions, uh, in the gray area here is where the animals were still treated, and you can see it here. And during the treatment, when the animals were treated, we observed about 10% reduction in methane emissions uh, during um, per day. When the animals, when the animals, uh, the treatment was a stop, uh, sorry, the times in weeks uh, means um, relative to winning. So one and uh, week one, those animals had uh, 12 weeks and at week 12, those animals have 23 weeks uh, of age. So the time relative to winning um, after the treatment was um, stopped there was a decrease of about 11%. And when we retook the animals and we measure again methane emissions, the um, decrease was still there. The reduced uh, emissions was still there. There was a slight difference in weight in the animals, but when we calculated the grams of methane emitted or kilograms of body weight, the difference were still uh, there, were still visible and significant. So in terms of the um, microbial communities in the different um, populations, we saw no changes in alpha diversity and total ruminal archaea or bacteria that were measured by qPCR. But uh, when analyzing the beta diversity for the bacteria and using sparse PLS DA, we, we observed a difference between groups and at all with all samples, and those differences were even higher when we took a week by week of um, of the different during the different times of of the study. In terms of uh, archaea, 
what you can see here is the, the standard and normal progression of the different groups of metanogenic archaea from the beginning of the study up to the end. And as for bacteria, we could see a difference between the two groups. And as an example, when the animals were treated in week 14, the, those differences were quite similar to when the animals were not treated and when they were uh, one year old. In rumen fungi, similar changes at bacteria and archaea. Uh, this is an example of the fungi at week 60. Low or less differences were observed in rumen protozoa, just minor changes. Um, for the fecal microbiota, we did observe uh, differences in bacteria only. So to finish, um, what we show with this experiment that modulating this experiment and other studies as well, uh, that modulating the gastrointestinal tract microbiota colonization is something that is possible and seems to, to occur when you treat the animals early in life. Um, some of these changes are persistent that follow in the cessation when the, the treatment stop. And the persistency of methane reduction uh, phenotype were observed in some cases, particularly in the one that I was uh, showing you before using the 3NOP. So using that approach, we um, succeeded in changing a little bit the microbial composition and that microbial composition of the room was stable uh, later on uh, when the animals were higher, uh, were older. That, of course, uh, using a feed additive, um, but that opened up a novel perspective, which I'll say, for reducing enteric methane emissions in ruminants, and that, of course, have to be validated by other studies in using another type of uh, production systems, uh, other type also of additives and not just additives, there are possibilities also to modulate this microbial colonization by other means that could be the diet, could be the contact with other animals, microbiota engraftment or pro prebiotics or the use of pro and prebiotics. And with that, I uh, would like uh, to thank you for your attention. And this is the people that were involved in the work and some of the funders uh, for the studies that I showed you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego. Uh, we have uh, no questions at the moment in the chat. So maybe I can start by the first one. While the attendees maybe will will have some other questions in the chat. Um, so some years ago, Diego, we we read that uh, read that uh, kangaroos in Australia have a specific um, microbiote, uh, apparently producing less methane than uh, our ruminants. Uh, I did not follow the literature on that, but uh, was it followed by something concrete and something more? Substantial is that, that or? Mm, well, you mean trying to apply the finding in kangaroos yes, to ruminants? Yes, yeah, yes. The, the, um, there were some attempts to do that, but it's not that easy. Um, well, the, the use of those bacteria present in kangaroos uh, are not well adapted. The, to, to take the story short, sure, in, yes. in, in a nutshell, th those bacteria are not well adapted to the rooming environment. So this is not this is not a line that we can think will be followed uh, soon. Not no. not at the not soon, uh, shall I say? Yeah. 
and and there was also some some uh, proposition on immunization against uh, this uh, specific uh, RKA. Uh, is it is it something also which could be uh, a line to to follow or I I think that that's something that was uh, initially proposed in Australia, um, that's followed up in New Zealand. Um, they are still working on that, but uh, I have no information of uh, how it's developing, but they are still working on that approach. Okay, uh, we, have, we, we do not have any question, except if I am wrong uh, on the chat. But maybe the other speakers have uh, questions. I don't know if Andrea or Frank would ask to ask some question to, to Diego. Yeah, I, I do have a question. I always assumed that 3NOP uh, really acts more on the enzymatic level of methane formation. And I had not heard that it changes the microbial composition. Uh, so that was news to me. Um, yeah, actually. It, it blocks specifically one enzyme in the methanogenesis pathway. So, mm -hmm. but if you if you follow the literature on CNOP, how it's applied to, to other animals, you can expect a decrease in about 20, 30 or more or 40 percent in animals in, in this case it was quite different in the approach um, because we started treated the animal treating the animals when there was almost no methane emissions so trying mm -hmm. to to tweak a little bit that colonization uh, uh, to tell the truth we were surprised uh, to see those results and i just uh, crossed my fingers and see that it should be repeated by somewhere else in another conditions that's that's the that's my wish <laughs> very good thanks thank you i don't know if andrea has some questions on that no no thank you so maybe we can stop here thanking again uh, diego morgavi for his presentation and uh, giving the floor to uh, Andrea Vitali uh, for the next presentation. Uh, Andrea is a professor, associate professor in animal husbandry at the University of Tuscia, Italy. He is teaching uh, animal biology, animal science, animal health and welfare, and environmental sustainability of livestock activities, quality of products of animal origin, and uh, he's a specialist uh, on, on the two Two, two, uh, two legs, one of, on the effect of uh, climate change on the on livestock, on the, eff on the effect of life livestock on climate change. So, uh, Andrea, you have uh, the floor for 20 minutes, please. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Um, thank you for AFP to, for this invitation. So I'm Andrea Vitali and um, today, uh, good afternoon to attending. And today I will talk about ruminant and climate change, greenhouse gas emission, and mitigation strategy. Uh, mm, so uh, the relationship between uh, ruminants and climate uh, are complex. From one side, uh, ruminants contribute to climate change, uh, emit greenhouse gas emission and contribute to climate change. And um, the these changes are increasing temperature, uh, change the rainfall pattern, uh, uh, weather extreme events that uh, on the other side impact on climate uh, on the ruminants. And uh, so in this context, uh, uh, mitigation uh, strategy are, are aimed to reduce the contribution to climate change and adaptation uh, action strategy are aimed to reduce the impact of uh, climate change on livestock or in this case uh, in, on ruminants. Uh, so uh, in 2006 uh, was released uh, this report of how that everybody knows uh, that is the livestock long shadow that uh, highlight for the first time the contribution of livestock uh, to climate change. Um, the these authors estimated the contribution of 18% in carbon dioxide equivalent 
and of which 9% of uh, carbon dioxide, 37% of methane, and 75% of uh, nitric oxide. So a new report uh, uh, releases some years later in 2013, uh, revises this contribution to 14%. So now uh, I report here the, an overview of the European greenhouse gas emission from 1999 uh, to uh, 2019 um, for all um, sector, productive sector. Um, so first of all, uh, 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 it's important to notice that agriculture is the second source and it accounts for 10.5% uh, uh, of uh, uh, total greenhouse mass gas emission released in, in Europe. And the uh, energy, se uh, energy sector is the first uh, source and it shares 77%. The second information uh, is that the agricultural sector reduced the um, greenhouse gas emission by 20% in this time frame. Uh, however, uh, between 2005 and 2019, uh, the, oh, sorry, um, the, um, uh, the greenhouse gas emission have uh, another slight decrease uh, uh, of two two percent, and the same trend is expected by two thousand thirty. Um, so, in uh, this slide, uh, I show the, the distribution of uh, uh, European agricultural greenhouse gas emission among the different source category for the year to, to two thousand nineteen. So these are the category uh, source that are uh, that all together give the the ten percent that we already uh, seen before. Um, so um, methane emission uh, from cattle fermentation is the the main source and share thirty seven percent of uh, greenhouse gas uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, Direct uh, nitrox oxide emission from soil management is the second spot and shared 32%. And methane and nitrox oxide from farming and in housing and manure storage account for 9.5% respectively. Uh, on the table are reported the, the change uh, in this uh, source uh, during this, uh, this time. Uh, mm, Methane from enteric fermentation cattle was reduced by 21%. Um, methane from enteric fermentation of sheep was reduced by 29%. Uh, methane from manure management of cattle by 14%. Uh, nitroxide from uh, manure management of cattle by 27%. Um, nitroxide from um, grazing animals by 26% and nitroxide from management soil by 70%. Um, so the, 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 main, uh, the main drive of this reduction of um, methane and nitroxide from a ruminant system across Europe was the reduction of population. Uh, the recattle population decrease of about uh, 50 million in this time, uh, as well as sheep that decrease uh, of uh, uh, 40 million. The same degrees, uh, even uh, not the cattle degrees in this time, about 10 million. Uh, the other uh, reason uh, uh, that drive for the, the reduction of uh, all uh, greenhouse gas emission, and in particular nitroxide from soil emission, was the nitrate directive released in 1991 by European Commission. So these are the main reasons uh, for the reduction of greenhouse gas emission in Europe. Uh, so uh, how, uh, how to account to the greenhouse gas emission from ruminant system? Um, here I, I show you um, um, the, this, the, the scheme of life cycle assessment that is a methodology for assessing environmental impacts associated with all stage of a life cycle or a product or a system. LCA consider all stage of cycle from cradle to grave. Uh, and in the case of milk or meat, uh, uh, 
um, LCA include cropping activity, farming activity, processing of food, retails, consumption, and uh, waste disposal. Um, Considering the activity uh, at farm gate, the main source of emission from soil, uh, emission from manure management, and uh, emission from enteric fermentation. Uh, the LCA, LCA that account only for greenhouse gas emission is called carbon footprint. Um, here, I, I just want to show uh, how much is used this uh, uh, LCA, so this uh, methodological um, uh, assessment uh, in, uh, in to evaluate environmental uh, impact of uh, uh, ruminant system. So I searched uh, on Scopus with keyword LCA, ruminants, cattle, dairy, etc. And uh, I found uh, about 800 documents released in the last 20 years. Uh, so um, uh, the number of pub publication uh, you can see in the, in the graph here uh, uh, has continuous increase as uh, evidence of the growing interest uh, in the studying the relationship between uh, livestock and environment. So why do an LCA um, for uh, um, why do why perform these kinds of analysis? So LCA allow us uh, uh, allow an environmental assessment of a product or system. So LCA tell us where we are. <clears throat> LCA LCA allow to identify the hotspot within the cycle. For example, we know that uh, uh, enteric fermentation is the hotspot uh, um, in the ruminant system. LCA allow us uh, allow to assess the impact of mitigation action. So we can use this uh, 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 methodological approach to verify the impact of uh, some mitigation uh, or the, the potential of mitigation strategy. Uh, uh, finally, LCA analysis enabled the development of environmental marketing strategy bank of support of uh, acquisition of environmental level. So uh, it's an um, uh, uh, instrument that uh, give the opportunity to communicate the, the environmental performance. Um, so uh, mitigation of regional gas uh, emission can be achieved indirectly uh, by improving production uh, efficiency. Uh, that reduce the emission intensity. Emission intensity is, is uh, the rate of unit of carbon dioxide uh, per unit of product. <clears throat> the emission intensity can be reduced uh, by uh, the uh, increasing, uh, increasing uh, yield per head, uh, improving the reproduction, uh, improving animal welfare and that. <clears throat> Direct mitigation strategy are aimed uh, to reduce emission per head or increase carbon sequestration from soil. And they consider selecting low methane emitting animals, feeding management, and we just um, see some, some example, uh, manure management and uh, soil management. Uh, so here is a research, uh, um, American research that was published in 2009. <clears throat> And the objective of this study was to compare the environmental impact of modern uh, 2007 uh, US dairy production system with uh, historical production practice that was referred to in 1944. And um, uh, it's a common perception that dairy system of the past uh, based on pasture was more sustainable of modern ones. So what this was the um uh the question uh so the the, the authors show that uh, during this time uh the the population dairy cattle decreased from 25 million uh, to about 10 million <clears throat> in the same time uh milk production increased from 2000 uh, kilogram per cow per year to 9000 kilogram per cow per year uh on the on the right uh, uh, in this graph uh, is reporting the 
uh, emission intensity per cow and emission intensity per kilogram of milk. So when we consider emission intensity per cow, um, the uh, past system uh, released less greenhouse gas emission. So the emission increases uh, with the per cow with the modern uh, dairy system. Uh, when we consider the, the production of milk uh, that uh, include all sorts of greenhouse gas emission from milk production, including animals, uh, uh, cropping, fertilizer, and manure management, uh, the carbon footprint was 63% uh, lower per unit of milk. And the, the author uh, stated that this reduction was related to the advance in dairy production by genetic selection, uh, by the improving in feeding uh, management, uh, health programs, and better management practices of the, the farm, uh, reduced the resource use, uh, waste output, uh, and greenhouse gas, gas emission per unit of uh, milk. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this is um, our study uh, that uh, was aimed to assess the, um, to verify the, 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 the impact of cooling, um, cooling operation uh, on carbon footprint. So um, the, um, the cooling operation are implemented to reduce some of its stress in the cattle, and they, uh, and they represent an effective adaptation strategy to the uh, waves that are increasing in frequency and intensity across Europe. So the, the aim of the study was to verify whether the energy required to run the funds could increase the carbon footprint of milk. In this study, we consider a cooling season of 135 days. That is the cooling, the, the normal cooling season in the uh, Italian summer condition and the 18 hours day of working fund. So we modeled this data into a uh, LCA analysis. This is the boundary system that we considered. So we found uh, a slight decrease of carbon footprint associated to cooling operation. So mean uh, 0 0.8 the degrees. Uh, so they increased the carbon dioxide emission related to energy demand uh, for cooling operation was offset by the improved production feeding, so that the milk saved the, in the summer for the use of cooling uh, um, uh, cooling device. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, improving in uh, production um, lower the carbon intensity of milk. Uh, this data are interesting, and we. Uh, we, we would like to continue to, uh, to investigate this, uh, this topic. Uh, cooling cows seem to be an adaptation strategy to, to climate change that could be synergic with uh, mitigation goals. So um, sometimes there is some trade-off uh, between mitigation and adaptation strategy. In this case, um, it seems that uh, mm, uh, it's, uh, this strategy is win for adaptation and win for mitigation. Uh, so uh, another way to uh, so um, coming to the the, the direct uh, mitigation option. Um, uh, so uh, the communities um, uh, are invest are are looking uh, if it's possible to select uh, low emitting uh, methane cows. So uh, animals that emit less methane. Uh, this uh, uh, this paper reported that uh, um, a, a irritability uh, for methane emission is 0 0.21, and the the methane enteric emission uh, as a genetic correlation 0 0.4 with productive trait. So the author showed that selecting for meat production, so the current selection will increase daily methane production by 30 percent by 2050. This means uh, more 50 grams day cow. At the same time, the, the increase in milk uh, per cow will reduce uh, carb, uh, methane uh, intensity by 13%. Uh, the author stated that uh, methane emission intensity can be reduced by 24% when the selection combines methane and other relevant breeding traits. 
Um, so uh, uh, this is a, a, a feeding uh, a feeding strategy, a feeding study. Um, we already uh, Diego talking about uh, three uh, three knob. Uh, I mean that the uh, trinoxy <laughs> propanol that is an organic compound and uh, it is an inhibitor of uh, methanogenesis. And then this year it was approved for the use on dairy cow in the uh, in the Europe. So on the left and uh, um, in this table, yeah, I reported the, the result of uh, um, our search where um, the, were tested two concentration of uh, of NOP. Uh, uh, 60 and 80 milligrams uh, per kilogram of diameter, and uh, in relation to three basal diets, uh, grassilage basal diet, uh, basal diet, and uh, grassilage and corn silage uh, mixed uh, diet, and uh, corn silage basal diet. So the best uh, reduction was observed. Uh, uh, in grass silage and uh, corn silage mixed diet and in corn silage uh, basset diet. Uh, on, the, on the right, <clears throat> I reported um, 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 a graph, a, a research where uh, were tested uh, um, uh, NOP and uh, canola oil alone or in combination. Um, the, 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 the author reported that the, the effect of no or, or, or canola oil alone was uh, in the reduction of uh, enteric methane emission was uh, 28 and 24 percent respectively. And when the combination between no uh, and, uh, and uh, canola oil, the reduction of enteric methane emission was uh, of uh, 51 percent. Um, uh, sorry, I, I missed this uh, slide before. This is another diet ma manipulation that considered the um, uh, addition of uh, uh, seaweed, Asparagopsis taxiformi. This was a trial that investigated the effect of this um, uh, seaweed on beef. And uh, the, the researcher used three concentration, low, mid, and high. And uh, they observed the uh, reduction of meat of 40% in uh, medium concentration and the reduction 98% uh, in correspondence of uh, high uh, concentration. Uh, so um, the, the, here I reported the um, um, uh, in this table, I reported uh, the contribution of several manure ending strategy uh, to reduce methane and nitroxide. Uh, in, in the table, it's also reported the effect on these products on ammonia. Ammonia is not a greenhouse gas. Uh, however, uh, it is an important component, a component of manure nitrogen cycle. So it's important to uh, consider ammonia uh, when we um, perform some of these uh, uh, practices. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, um, it's it's that is notice that some um, some practices have a, a, a potential good effect. So uh, it's a reduction of. Uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission and ammonia, for example, the grid storage time uh, um, reduce uh, uh, methane, hydroxide, and uh, uh, ammonia. In uh, other techniques uh, or practices like aeration of manure, uh, work well with uh, methane uh, is uh, an O with uh, ammonia, and there are evidence that it could, uh, it, uh, this technique can increase. Uh, and nitroxide. Um, so, um, soil organic carbon sequestration um, SOC, has been considered as a possible uh, possible solution to mitigate climate change. Uh, boost carbon uh, storage in agricultural soil may reduce the global carbon footprint. Uh, then agriculture can play a crucial role in mitigation of climate change. Uh, studies uh, across the globe have a mysterious stock 
uh, sequestration rate, and they suggest that an annual stock of carbon per hectare is possible after the adoption of the best management practice. Uh, so here are reporting several uh, practices, um, control soil erosion, uh, of nice stocking density in grazing animals, uh, or perennial crops, uh, or um, optimized nutrient input, or reduced tillage or not tillage. Uh, um, carbon uh, soil sequestration is very important, and in the COP21, so that was held in Paris in uh, 2015. In this day, it started the COP27. Uh, um, it was launched the initiative of 44,000, that is aimed to increase carbon sequestration of 0.4% in the soil. So the stock, uh, the the 0.4 percent of stock increase year in the top one meter of global agricultural soil may offset uh, from 20 to 35 of global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emission. Uh, considering the the um, grazing. Uh, Greatest grassland is a potential sink of uh, carbon and uh, storing from 0.15 to 0.6 megagram of carbon per hectare per year. So, uh, and this um, figure is uh, um, mixed system grazing and cutting uh, um, is not so per performing like uh, only grazing. And the author reported that improving grazing uh, management, for example, including adjustment in animal stocking rates, uh, periodical removal of grazing livestock, length of grazing period, could further increase carbon by 0.28 uh, uh, megagrams uh, uh, per hectare per year. So in conclusion, uh, Continue to improve production efficiency uh, is the best indirect strategy uh, to mitigate greenhouse gas emission from ruminants. Um, optimize animal uh, productivity as a powerful mitigating effect in both uh, developed and developing countries. And uh, at the same time, it's the best way to meet future food needs of expanding world population. Animal breeding uh, that exploit natural variation and meat uh, emission is an additional uh, mitigating solution uh, that is cost effective, permanent, and cumulative. Considering that high yielding calves meet more methane, then when selecting uh, low emitters, it will be it, it will therefore be important to weight methane emission. Uh, and milk yield according to reduce the negative side effect. Actively selecting against methane emission, however, require large scale recording on individual methane um, emission. So this is uh, um, the limit that many research are, are, um, are trying to overcome with uh, sniffer measurement. Uh, diet manipulation is a strong strategy to reduce enteric methane emission. However, uh, the effects of the prolonged implementation at commercial scale are still unknown, as well as their economic sustainability. Several best practices are available for manure handling uh, that can effectively reduce greenhouse gas emission. Uh, it is important to remember, however, that some of these practices uh, may result in um, pollution swapping or increase uh, ammonia emission. Therefore, due to the numerous interaction at animal storage and the land application uh, phases of manure management process, uh, manure mitigation process uh, should be not evaluated individually, but as component of the livestock uh, production system as a wall. Finally, but not the, the last, increased carbon sequestration in agricultural soil can off offset greenhouse gas emission from a ruminant system. Soil management practices can improve soil health and fertility, and in doing so, uh, can also contribute to increase uh, carbon sequestration and uh, uh, mitigating climate change. The collaboration and communication between scientists 
farmers, policy makers are required to enhance carbon sequestration, monitor the impact of climate change on soil concentration, and provide technologies for soil measurements. So I'm finished and thank for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea, for, for your talk. Uh, interested very much. Um, the chat is, uh, is uh, deeply occupied by uh, the question to Diego, and uh, maybe I ask to, to the okay to the panelists to ask to Andrea. So the first question to Andrea. Did you see it, Andrea? Or uh, no, sorry. So I will repeat it. Uh, roughly, enteric fermentation in ruminants is responsible for less than five percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Does this low figure really support the big efforts, time and money addressed to reduce the source of greenhouse gas? Okay, uh, can I see the, the question? Where is the uh, you, you have to chat? The slide. chat, yes. This is the last uh, question of the slide from Antonio uh, de Vega. The question between the expenses and the part of uh, the, the proportion of it's a ruminant entire fermentation ruminants is responsible for less than five percent of the greenhouse gas emission. Uh, does this low figure really support the big effort, time, and money addressed to reduce this source of? Uh, I think that the the, the efforts uh, it's important to 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 make this effort to reduce and to make more sustainable. Uh, ruminant system, uh, even if these efforts uh, uh, will offset just a more uh, a share of this mission. Um, so um, my my answer is yes. Is uh, uh, is is correct to support this uh, effort? Time and uh, money to to reduce uh, or to increase sustainability in ruminants. At uh, I don't know if um, I. And you have a second question from Frederick Nasser about suck, sucking CO two from the air. It's only for me. Uh, only uh, for yes, me. for you. Yes, I think. <laughs> uh, where I can, it's, uh, it's, uh, This is just after the question of Antonio de Vega. Okay, this question for uh, from Diego. To, uh, I can find uh, that's on the back on the back of the list because there was a little a lot of question for for Diego. Uh, um, can you read, please? Uh, we must suck CO two from the air, and agriculture can play a major role in the regard. Perhaps this is our short term solution of sucking CO two from the air. Yes, this is a short-term solution, but uh, it can give uh, us the time to to improve some uh, mitigation techniques or improve technology uh, to reduce uh, uh, emission uh, from animal or manure management. So this is uh, um, uh, a good option to take time and to have time to develop uh, uh better uh, practice uh that can act on animal or farm okay and uh, martina dorigo ask uh, maybe if the other sources sources will make efforts to reduce emissions the enteric emission the enteric fermentation percentage will become more relevant so it means if the other sectors do efforts and uh, livestock not do efforts Maybe this will be relevant, I think. Uh, um, I, I don't understand the question. Maybe if I just, just the, before the last one. The last one? No, before the last one, a question from Martina Dorigo. Martina. MD. Um, many questions there are. Um, just at the back on the list of the list. Uh, Martina, okay, Martina. Ah, Martina de Riga said that. Maybe if the other source will make effort to reduce emission, the entire fermentation will become more than. 
I think that uh, maybe it would be better if other um, sector, and uh, I, I mean uh, energy sector, uh, will reduce the contribution, because I think that later um, Frank uh, will talk about the difference of uh, fossil emission and uh, biogenic emission. So there is a, a important difference between uh, methane from a ruminant that's a biogenic and that can be considered in a cycle, natural cycle, uh, compared to fossil um, emission uh, that uh, came from some um, fossil type like uh, oil or coal or like something that, that needs a long time to be stored. Um, so I think that uh, it's important that all sector uh, uh, make something of relevant to decrease uh, greenhouse gas emission because uh, uh, um, the, the the COP twenty seven that uh, is starting. Uh, so it seems that uh, we we are not doing uh, what we need to decrease uh, uh, temperature increase. So we are late to to keep temperature below one point five uh, Celsius. That was the uh, the objective in the COP twenty one seven years uh, ago. So we missed this. Um, uh, this uh, uh, this objective, and um, so the, the it's expected a higher increase of temperature, higher than one point five. Okay, okay, and, and the, the, the the next question after the question of uh, Martina, and this will be the last one, but I think it is interesting. If you read it, the question from Joan Edwards. Joan uh, Edwards uh, on, on the uh, is is a LCA including uh, additives uh, calculation, the footprint of producing additives. Uh, okay, uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, it's not easy to, to calculate this uh, because uh, LCA needs uh, a lot of information. And uh, uh, so there are some, um, the, the, the database, uh, for example, I, I report from my experience, uh, we use uh, Sima Pro software and the database is uh, continuous increasing and even for additive uh, feed additive. So um, it's important to, of course, weigh the, the, the emission related to the production of this additive or, for example, the production of some uh, I talked about uh, seaweed or uh, other additive. So it's important to evaluate the, the emission related to this and to see if. Uh, 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 at least uh, the the carbon footprint can be reduced or increased. So um, this this sector is uh, um, this uh, growing. So the many many data are uh, are coming. So and the database are even more more rich. So I think that uh, it will be possible to evaluate uh, the effect of this additive, including the the, the emission related to their production. Yes, uh, it is true also for not for, for a large footprint. I mean, not, not only for uh, methane emission, not, not only for greenhouse gas, but also yes, for yeah, biodiversity. Yeah. For yes. seaweed, for seaweed, for example, I'm questioning about the impact on biodiversity, for example. Yes. So uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Please, uh, if, you, if you can, you can. Uh, there are other questions uh, coming. Maybe you have to see the chat and uh, an answer to the other question uh, to everybody so we can continue okay. on. The... So thank you very much. Uh, we will we'll skip the coffee break <laughs> and pass directly to the Frank Mitloener uh, presentation if you if you want. So as I said, Frank is a, a professor and air quality specialist in a cooperative extension in the Department of Animal Science at the University of California, Davis, and director of the UC Davis Clear Center. So he's well known in the, in the sector of uh, creating better efficiency and, and, and mitigate pollutants. He's uh, passionate about understanding and mitigating air emission from livestock operation as well as studying the implications of these emissions on the health of farmers work, farm workers and neighboring communities. So thank you, Frank. You have the floor now. 
Yes, hello. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I greatly appreciate having the floor. I also uh, liked it very much uh, to hear and listen to what my previous speaker said. Uh, I think uh, the three speeches will complement quite well. Um, I was asked to uh, how to manage methane to make uh, life a part of a climate solution. And um, I think what's really important just by the title alone is to emphasize that while it's true that there are many industries that are greenwashing and uh, using all kinds of weird um, um, treaties and so on, made real progress to find ways of minimizing methane, and that is really a key in achieving um, climate neutrality. So uh, we have already heard that there are uh, differences across greenhouse gases. They are traditionally summarized by using a so-called matrix, and that matrix is called Global Warming Potential, GWP100. You will hear this mentioned numerous times uh, during my talk. Uh, what GWP100 refers to is how um, methane, for example, is compared to CO2. And uh, what the comparison is right now is that methane is approximately 28 times more potent in trapping heat from the sun than an equal one molecule of, of CO2. So it is certainly a gas that has a serious punch to it in trapping heat from the sun. And nitrous oxide, as you can see here, even more so. But as you can see in a few minutes, um, limiting the differences across these greenhouse gases just to their ability to trap heat um, is really um, not telling the whole story. You've seen this slide here earlier. It shows the global methane budget, but I want to point out an important detail here. On the left side, you see various sources of methane. It includes fossil fuel production, use agriculture, biomass burning, wetlands, and so on. All of these sources combined amount, and you see it in the first half bubble, a total of 500, approximately 560 teragrams globally. But what's important to mention is that methane, in contrast to other greenhouse gases, is not just produced by various sources, but on the right side, you see that it's also destroyed. There are sinks, and these sinks amount to um, an almost equal total number, and that is 550. So 560 teragrams are produced, 550 are destroyed, and that leaves the balance of approximately 10. 10 is still a number that we seek to further reduce. Uh, I want to be very clear about this, but it is important to mention that methane has a process that destroys it. You see on the right side the large arrow pointing down, and underneath it says sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. And what this means is that when a, a methane molecule is in the air, it takes about 10 years approximately for it to find um, another molecule called a radical, and this radical oxidizes the methane. It destroys it and makes it back to where it came from, which is CO2. So when looking at the impact methane has on warming, it's actually very important to consider that this gas is not just produced, like CO2 or nitrous oxide, but also destroys, uh, destroyed because that affects its actual behaving uh, behavior on warming. Um, the first ones to bring this whole issue of how we quantify methane up was a group from Oxford University in the UK. Um, group was uh, or is under Professor Miles Allen uh, at Oxford Martin, and um, they said, "Well, look, uh, the way that we are quantifying methane's impact on climate change by using GWP one hundred um, is not really." Uh, accurate, because they said that um, by doing so, let's say if we have a constant source of methane, let's say a constant cattle herd in a given locality, then we need to attribute not just that it's produced, but also that it's destroyed. Because only if we consider both, then we can evaluate its true impact on warming, and that's what we're all about. So they have said for years, and I concurred, that if you use this old matrix that was uh, devised back in 1990 called GWP100 on a constant source of methane, let's say a constant cattle herd, then this will overblow the impact on warming by a factor of four. So they said that if you use this old matrix GWP100 on a constant source, you're overblowing its impact by a factor of four. 
Now, uh, they received a lot of criticism for that initially, and um, they developed a new matrix to replace GWP100 called GWP star. GWP star does not just simply convert methane into CO2 equivalent units by saying uh, methane times 28 is the CO2 equivalent amount, but they look at the impact of methane over time. So they look at the rate of change of methane from, let's say, 1980 to the year 2000 to the year 2020. And then they look at whether or not methane over time goes up, stays stable, or goes down. Because as you can see in a few minutes, this has a profound impact on its actual warming. So they got this GWP star. And GWP star actually looks at the impact of methane on actual warming. So it accounts for the relative short lifespan of this gas, and thereby it accounts for the atmospheric removal through this oxidation process that I uh, talked about earlier. To my great um, surprise and um, enjoyment, the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change in last year's report, AR6, agreed with the criticism and said, and here in the yellow box, um, by comparison, expressing methane emissions as CO2 equivalent emissions using GWP100 overstates the effect of constant methane emissions on global surface temperatures by a factor of three to four. So the IPCC agreed that this unit that the world has been using, GWP100, um, overblows the impact of this gas when there is a constant source by a factor of three to four. It also continues to say that GWP100 underestimates the impact of increasing sources of methane. So GWP100 has challenges, okay? The whole world is using it, but I think it's now pretty much um, out there that it has significant challenges. And if we want to devise plans for the future to become climate neutral, then GWP100 will likely not get us to identifying the goalpost and the milestones on how to get us there. Just really quickly, there are three slides that are a little bit technical, but quite important. A comparison first between CO2 and how CO2 warms the planet and then methane and how that warms the planet. So imagine you were to live 20 kilometers away from home. So every day you have to drive. On day one, on Monday, you drive your car, you burn gas, and you put CO2 into the atmosphere. On day two, on Tuesday, you drive the same distance again and you put new additional CO2 into the atmosphere. And remember, this gas has a lifespan, CO2 has a lifespan of 1,000 years. Methane has a lifespan of 10 to 12 years. So on Tuesday, you drive again, you burn more gas, and now you add new additional CO2 to the existing stock from Monday. On Wednesday, you drive again, on Thursday, on Friday, and every time you do that, you add new additional carbon to the existing stock from the day prior, the week prior, the month prior, the years prior, and so on. This gas stays in the atmosphere for a thousand years. There is no atmospheric removal of the kind that we know of happening in methane, because methane does have an atmospheric removal, this oxidation process that I talked about, and as a result, methane is not a stock gas. It does not accumulate like CO2 does. Methane is a so-called flow gas. It's both produced and destroyed. If you have constant sources of methane, then you have a constant impact on warming. That does not mean that methane doesn't matter at all. In fact, you will see in a few minutes uh, how much it means and how much it matters to reduce methane. But Methane warms the planet in a different way because it's not just produced, but also destroyed. And that makes methane a flow gas. So how does that matter practically? Um, let's imagine two different sources of greenhouse gases. One source is a power plant emitting increasing amounts of CO2 over time. The other one on the top left is uh, a cattle herd. Let's say the cattle herd is increasing over the 30 years from, let's say, 1,000 cattle to 1,500 cattle. So both of these gases, CO2 from the power plant and methane from the cattle herd, they both go up over time. What does that do to the related warming? You see it at the bottom panel. 
The related warming from a linear increase, uh, increasing CO2 source leads to an exponential increase in CO2, and it's exponential because this gas is a stock gas, it accumulates, um, whereas methane, a linear increase of that, say by an increasing cattle herd, will lead to an equally linear increasing warming. If you hold two sources, two sources the power plant and the cattle herd constant, so let's say over 30 years, the power plant produces the same amount of power year after year after year, producing a, a constant amount of CO2 year after year after year. Then you see that at the bottom panel, the related warming for the CO2 still goes up. And the reason why it goes up, it doesn't stay stable is because it's a cumulative gas that accumulates in the atmosphere. So it becomes more and more and more higher and higher in concentration over time. But methane does not, because it's not just produced, it's also destroyed. A constant source of methane, let's say a constant cattle herd, will lead to constant amounts of warming. And I want to remind you of what the previous speaker said. The Paris Climate Accord is asking us to refrain from additional, from causing additional warming. Um, it says we should keep um, additional warming to less than one and a half to two degrees centigrade. So that's really what the charge is. And if you have a constant source of methane, you're causing constant warming and not additional warming. If, however, we now go to the scenario that we are all striving for, which is to reduce emissions, then you can see that CO2 versus methane, when both are reduced, have a drastically different behavior on warming result. So if we start with CO2. Let's say our power plant is decreasing the amount of power produced over time and eventually is shut down because let's say it's a coal-fired power plant. Uh, politics decides to turn those things off after a while. Let's say that were to happen. Then what happens to the related warming that you see at the bottom right? Even if you decrease CO2 over time and eventually shut it down, the related warming still goes up. It still goes up all the way to the time when you shut down, and that's net zero, when you shut down that power plant, at which point the related warming plateaus, but it doesn't go down, it just plateaus. So even a decrease of a CO2 source will not lead to a decrease in warming. The best of all cases would be that you get a plateauing of warming, but not a reduction. But now look what happens to methane. When you reduce methane, you get almost an instantaneous reduction in warming. And that makes methane really special. Sometimes people ask me, Frank, is methane a super pollutant? And I say, in my opinion, CO2 is the greatest super pollutant because even if we reduce it, we are increasing warming. Okay? So CO2 is a real challenge for us. Whereas to me, methane is more of a super opportunity because if we learn to mitigate it, and my colleagues who spoke prior have shown many ways of doing so, if we manage to mitigate methane, we are reducing warming. A reduction of methane is a reduction of warming. And that makes it a really important lever in our fight against a changing climate. One more slide that's a little on the technical side, but very important in my opinion. It shows three scenarios for methane. Over 30 years, the top one shows an increasing amount of methane. We find this in parts of the developing world where livestock herds are growing. So an increasing amount of methane on top, followed by a pretty stable amount of methane over 30 years. We slightly reduce it by 10%, but it's relatively stable. And the third one is one where we reduce methane by a lot, 35%. This is really what approximately the amount is that the global methane pledge is seeking. So how would these three scenarios, the increasing, the stable, and the decreasing amount of methane be depicted using the old matrix GWP100? GWP100 would predict that in all three cases, the increasing, the stable, and the decreasing methane scenario, we would add a lot of additional CO2 equivalent uh, amount of greenhouse gases causing a lot of additional warming. But because methane is not a stock gas, but a flow gas, we know that at least the second and third scenario are depicted wrong, which has now also been shown in the IPCC AR6 report. So how does this new matrix from Oxford GWP star um, compare to GWP 100? Well, GWP star 
um, agrees in the top scenario that if we add a lot of additional methane, then we cause a lot of additional warming. And that's the blue north of the x-axis. We do not want to increase methane. If we do, that has a huge punch to it. We would cause additional warming. But look what happens if you slightly reduce methane over, over 30 years. You now don't see any blue north of the axis, north of the x-axis um, in, in the middle scenario there on the right side. But you even see a negative sign in front of the number. And that's because we're reducing methane by 10% over 30 years. And that means we are now having blue south of the x-axis. And that indi indicates a little bit of negative warming negative warming being a fancy word for cooling. In the bottom right scenario, you see what happens if you strongly reduce methane. We now reduce a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, and that has the same effectiveness as, as, let's say, planting forests. We are taking carbon out of the air, and that means we are net reducing warming. And ladies and gentlemen, if we do this by enough, if we reduce methane by 30 or 40%, then that reduces the carbon emissions by so much and the related warming on the methane side that it has the potency and it has the potential of reducing warming, offsetting other greenhouse gases such as nitrous oxide and CO2 that our farms also produce. If the methane reduction is strong enough, it can offset other greenhouse gases, getting our farms to be net zero warming, no additional warming. And if we go beyond that point, I also call it climate neutrality, when we go beyond this point of offsetting nitrous oxide and CO2 through reductions of methane, if we go beyond this point, we can offset historical contributions or even contributions from other sectors such as the fossil fuel sector. This makes us a potential for a climate solution. Here in California, where we have very aggressive uh, laws, for example, on methane, um, the state has done something unusual, which is it has decided to work with the livestock sector to reduce methane gas. The goal is to reduce methane by 40% here in California, 4-0. And that's to be achieved by the year 2030. The state did something unusual, I said it. The state decided to financially incentivize methane reductions working with farmers to reduce methane, partnering with farmers to reduce methane, for example, by sharing the cost of covering the manure storage that you see here, the bottom right. When you store the manure um, uh, storage area, then um, you see the gas underneath uh, is bulging up. That's biogas. 60% of this biogas is methane. But this methane is now not going into the atmosphere. This biogas is not burned like this in most European digesters, but this biogas is now taken and made into transportation fuels uh, for semi-trucks and buses to replace diesel. So many dairies have done this already that the dairy sector in California has already uh, achieved 30% of its methane reduction goal. If you consider all dairies in California to produce about 7% million metric tons of CO2 equivalent gases, so seven, then we have already reduced 2.3 of the seven. So uh, that is a sizable chunk, considering that we just started this a few years ago. I am very bullish to believe that we will achieve the 40% reduction of methane in the timeline that the law says. But it's only possible because the state financially incentivizes this. If this were done with rules, regulations, and fines, we would not be where we are now. This is what it looks like when you take dairy RNG, renewable natural gas, that is the result of biogas from covered lagoons. If you take this renewable natural gas and you then use it in vehicle fleets, such as semi-trucks or buses. So that to me is a real success story. I'm proud of being part of this and having uh, investigated a lot of this. And I'm proud of our state showing leadership in this field and partnering with the, with the livestock sector. This is a way that works. And so to me, uh, one of the ways forward. In addition to reductions of methane from manure storages, and we have heard about this, there are also reductions possible from feed additives. Here are, Here's a listing of a few of them. 
Uh, my, my colleague Hermes Cabriab and I have done uh, several dozen studies on various of these feed additives. And we find that uh, reductions of anywhere from 10 to 30 or so percent are possible. And uh, many of those additives will be available in, I would say, five years from now. You in Europe have the advantage that your process, your regulatory process is much more streamlined. Here in the United States, uh, we need to undergo some changes to make sure that these additives are approved by our Department of Agriculture and not by the drug enforcement, so-called uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, as it is possible uh, currently. So we will have um, feed additives in our and yeah, at our disposal within the next few years. This is one of my last slides here. It shows on the x-axis the years, on the y-axis uh, CO2 warming equivalent units. In gray, you see business as usual. So if the dairy sector were to do nothing, then um, greenhouse gas uh, related warming equivalents would continue to uh, be in the positive area, meaning contributing to additional warming. If we reduce our methane by 40% just from manure alone, then the light blue scenario would occur. And if we were to combine the 40% manure methane reduction with a 10 or well, close to 11% enteric methane reduction, then the dark blue would occur. What the light blue and the dark blue uh, indicate is that if we reduce methane aggressively, like we are seeking to do, then very soon, namely by the year 2027, we will achieve a point of climate neutrality, a point by which our dairies no longer cause additional warming. And that, of course, is what we're all after. We want to be very clear about methane reductions being important. And once they are pursued by our farms aggressively, we will not cause additional warming. And uh, that is possible in the, in the very near future, as you can see here. We've published some of this uh, recently in the Journal of Dairy Science. Uh, this is a screenshot. Um, what we want to do with our dairy, with our beef sector is we want to cross this x-axis and get those sectors into a position where they do not cause additional warming. So just a last slide here. Uh, the CLEAR Center that I'm directing here at UC Davis helps our farmers uh, to arrive at solutions to reduce greenhouse gases and other criteria pollutants. We do research and extension, meaning science communication around these topics. Um, and help animal agriculture to become more sustainable. Um, our CLEAR Center is on the web. clear.ucdavis.edu is the web page. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. Just uh, really quickly, in 10 minutes, I have to run because I have to teach a class in 20. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, we already have two questions on the chat. I don't know if you can see. Uh, one is from... Uh, uh, John Petro about the origin of the ruminant feed, which seems very interesting. Uh, I don't know if you are able to see it. Um, a question by whom? By John Petro at uh, at 1627, just uh, not on the back of the list, but uh, uh, GF. It starts by, but all methane is not created equal. Yes. So um, what this gentleman is referring to is that um, the methane from livestock really originates, um, when you think about where that carbon comes from, it, it originates from CO2. CO2 that plants took on during photosynthesis is converted by these plants into cellulose, some of it into starch. The animals eat it. Um, and then in their rumen converts some of that carbon into methane. That methane stays in the air for 10, 12 years and is then converted during hydroxyl oxidation back into CO2. So it's a relatively short cycle that we're dealing with here on the livestock side, whereas on the fossil fuel side, and that's oil, coal, and gas, we're talking about carbon that was uh, part of living material plants and animals hundreds of millions of years ago. These plants and animals uh, lived, died, decayed, fossilized, and accumulated underground uh, as oil, coal, and gas. And then within the last 70 years, humans took about half of that fossil fuel out of the ground, and we burned it with cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships. And that is not a short-lived uh, cycle. That's a one-way street from the ground up into the air. 
That is why biogenic methane, let's say from cattle or other livestock, is um, not really causing new additional carbon, but fossil emissions always cause new and additional carbon. So that's a difference. Sorry for the long answer, but it is a complex question. No. Uh, the, the following question is from uh, John Edwards about paddy fields. Uh, asking, uh, this is of course not your your area of interest. <laughs> this is not a dairy, but uh, what, what would be a solution for reducing emissions from, from paddy fields? Uh, if not uh, diminishing uh, or eating rice. In rice? Yes. This is a, the, the question just after John Fitro, John Edwards. John Edward. So um, emissions from rice. Um, well, emissions from rice are, of course, also a big challenge, but uh, it's not as politically sensitive um, as emissions from livestock. Um, you know, nobody really has a beef with rice, so to say. <laughs> but um, it is possible to change emissions from rice. I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, one of the main reasons as to why rice is flooded is to control weeds. Um, because when you flood rice fields, then the weeds go bye-bye, they die, and, and the rice will not. So um, if you want to reduce methane emissions from rice, then you have to be okay with using other ways of controlling the weeds. And that's uh, a whole nother can of worms, um, because now you're dealing with, uh, with chemicals, agrochemicals that have other unintended consequences. So it's... Uh, not really my main area of, of work, yes. but is it possible in general? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for answering. And you have also after that a question from Antonio De Vega about uh, uh, the, Here's what the I found. Excuse me. Sorry, that was my watch talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this will be the last question for you uh, about about the power of the the power of methane uh, seven not twenty eight but seven point three times. Uh, more potent than CO2. Uh, could you clarify that point if you see the question? No, I cannot really. Um, I cannot really um, comment on that one. I um, I want to. I want to state very clearly that I'm not a climatologist, and I'm not really into um, debating what the actual warming potential is. Um, because that changes every few years, that number changes. Um, that to me is not as much of concern as the fact that this gas is significantly different in how it behaves and how it warms our planet. And uh, my main point is we have to account for the fact that this gas is not just produced but also destroyed. We have to account for the fact that it is a flow gas and not a stock gas and uh, that it has a drastically different impact on warming. And while that's a challenge due to its potency, it's also a significant opportunity because if we reduce this gas, we reduce warming. That is my take home message, okay? Yes. I'm not at all saying we, sh we, we should downplay methane. I don't think we should. I think methane is an important gas. It offers an important opportunity, particularly to the animal agricultural sector because it's our main greenhouse gas we're producing a lot of it. And if we manage it like we have been, you have seen some of the earlier numbers today. If we manage it like we have been, then we're doing the right thing, not just because it's green, helping the environment, but also because it helps us to stay in the green because we can financially benefit from that as well, mm. because we can be um, partners in carbon credit systems and so on, and actually um, become part of a climate solution. So while I cannot directly comment on this question, it's not really my my area. Uh, I want to I want to emphasize the importance of this gas and uh, our role in reducing it. Okay, and, and and maybe if you have some minutes, the last question from Diego is about the economics of uh, uh, on the chat uh, economics of uh, for the state of California. How much uh, is is he recovered by the state of of California by converting it to fuel? So, um, of course, a very important question. 
So uh, in general, the state of California is using taxpayers' money to reduce methane. And 2% of all taxpayers' money went into the dairy and livestock sector to reduce methane, 2% of the total public investment. But this 2% investment of taxpayers' dollars has led to a 30%, 30% reduction of methane in the state. So it's a, a very large 15 time, 15x return on investment that the state gets um, by incentivizing, by helping farmers to reduce methane. Um, just last not least, um, if you assume that the sales of the milk of a dairy cow per year generates about $4,000, so you get $4,000 per cow per year for the sales of the milk, then the sale of biogas and making that into transportation fuel per cow makes up $2,000. So we're talking about significant financial incentives to reduce methane. And that has gotten the attention of our farmers. And I would say there is a gold, a gold rush in California. It's not related to gold, but it's related to reducing its methane footprint and partaking into the carbon credit system. So from a financial perspective, it makes a lot of sense, both for the state and its citizens, as well as for our dairy and livestock sector. But my last comment is this, don't think that none of this is controversial because those people who are critical of animal agriculture do not really endorse those efforts that we are discussing here today. They don't want to see us reducing methane. They want the dairy, the livestock sector to get out of business. And yes. that is something that I'm experiencing here every day by an onslaught of criticism, even on efforts that involve mitigation, which makes no sense to me. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Frank, for, for this conclusion. It is, uh, it is very... Very interesting also for, for all, uh, not only for California, but of course for all US and, uh, and Europe. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, please go to, to give your, your, your course. Uh, I will close <laughs> the seminar soon, but uh, you, you are free to leave. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. So um, I think that we will, we will close uh, the, the webinar now. Uh, I want to thank all speakers and all attenders. Uh, for being so active. Uh, we cannot follow on with question and answer on the chat, but uh, you will find easily the uh, email addresses of the three speakers. So please uh, don't hesitate to send them some questions and uh, they will probably answer. So I would like also to, to thank uh, the EAP, WEAP staff for organizing uh, this webinar. Uh, and uh, giving you the opportunity uh, to to follow on the next one in, in the next month or in the following months. So bye bye everybody and uh, have a good uh, end of the day or night. Uh, depends where you are. Bye bye.